Well, thank you for having me. Uh, I just wanted to uh, talk about a concept that we put out a paper on, uh, which was basically looking at Mars Earth transit enabled by microwave beamers. And before I get into it, uh, if you see our title, it's Light Sales and Us and Them, them being ETs. Uh, I want to talk about us for a little bit. Um, so as a young person who did their first SETI paper, uh, this was my introduction to the community and the literature. And I did a lot of reading, and I did a lot of looking up of people's papers and things. And one thing that really stuck, stuck out to me was how inaccessible, in general, the papers are in SETI. Um, they are in very obscure journals, oftentimes, that even Harvard does not have a subscription to. So if you want to actually access these articles, oftentimes it involves me emailing the librarian. The librarian says, okay, I'll get you that article. Two weeks later, I'll get the article in an email. And so it just makes research extraordinarily slow on this topic, especially if I want to see what has been done before. And I really don't like repeating work that other people have done. And because I always feel like they're going to think, I'm going to claim that I've done this first. And it's really particularly a problem in SETI. And so it makes me a little nervous to write about things that I just don't know what's already been said. So I have a homework assignment for the people who have been in the SETI field for a while. If your paper is in one of these obscure journals and it cannot be found readily through an internet search, put it on the archive. The archive does not care if you submit a paper that's been posted in the journal in the 70s now. They're not going to enforce this. And I really think this is something you should do to promote your own work. And it will actually help the, f the field kind of flourish a little bit more for us young people. Because we really don't know what's been done. And I really was appreciative of actually Jim's latest paper because in there he has a table of concepts similar to the one that are in my paper, many of which I had no idea existed because they were in these journals. So that was my appeal. Um, please do this if you're one of these people who has these papers. All right, so now we'll actually get into the concept itself. <clears throat> okay, so I think I'm going to go really quickly through the mechanics of light sales since we're presumably all familiar with it by now. I'll talk a little bit about the current sail technology. I actually think some of these missions hadn't been discussed yet. Um, I'll briefly describe the difference between naturally and artificially propelled sails. Uh, we haven't really talked about using the sun too much, uh, so I'll go into that a little bit. Uh, I'll talk about basically this concept of building a light sail network in our own solar system and how they might actually have detectable signatures we might be able to uh, see from afar. All right, so why sail? Well, this is something that's been touched on. It's the uh, tyranny of the rocket equation. Uh, you basically gain only a logarithmic increase in the velocity of your craft as you increase the mass of the craft if you're relying on onboard fuel. And this is why the rockets that launch very modest sized payloads are huge, right? Like the Apollo rocket is this massive beast, and we're not able to really launch things that are much bigger than 100 tons that are not classified. Um, but in principle, this really limits us. And for some of the concepts we have here, when we're launching things into space first, and then we're hitting them with the beam, this is still a limit. In principle, the mothership has to be limited to that size. So the light sail, I mean, using light is really kind of crappy in general because it has very little momentum. Uh, and so really, uh, it's very inefficient. And an electric car really is much, much more efficient, say, than a light sail is. Uh, there's two real sources of energy if you're powering a light sail, the sun uh, and artificial beams, like we've been talking about. The sun, you're kind of limited to whatever the sun puts out. Uh, and if you do the math, uh, basically at an AU, you're not really able to get uh, sails to go very fast. What you can do to beat this a bit is put the sail right next to the sun. Right? You can basically start out from to our sun, uh, let the craft coast out from that point. And in that case, to really get to speeds that are anywhere near appreciable, you still need gigantic sails to do this. So uh, really, I think if you could use ablation, as a means of getting the sail to accelerate more. That's something that's a possibility, something you might be interested in considering, even for the concept of Starshot, where you might start out the sail being a little bit thicker than what you intend the final craft mass to be, to take advantage of the fact that 
you basically can gain a little bit from this chemical propulsion effect. Um, but again, you have the rocket equation as an issue. Uh, so even if you have a relatively fast exhaust velocity from the surface of the sail, you're still limited by this logarithmic increase. And in principle, while this can get you maybe the first few tens or hundreds of kilometers per second, potentially, uh, it doesn't really get you to, say, fractions of C like we've been talking about. Uh, so as far as I'm aware, and correct me if I'm wrong, there's been three successful sail launches. One is Icarus, uh, one is NanoSail D2, and one is LightSail A. Uh, I only could find um, the delta V for Icarus, and maybe the other two, this has been measured, but the delta V from Icarus from solar pressure was 400 meters per second. Now, Icarus is traveling around the sun at tens of kilometers per second. So it's like a few percentage change in its velocity from solar pressure, but it just demonstrates basically what we knew all, all along, that photons carry momentum. Um, so there are many other follow-up missions planned, some of which we heard about earlier. But uh, so what do we, why do we want to use these beams in our solar system? Um, well, this allows you to beat the sun, right? So you can provide increased energy density on the sail. And the other advantage of the beams is that you can use them to accelerate and decelerate. And so this is one key difference um, between something, a concept like Starshot, where you're just shooting something out, making it go as fast as you possibly want. Um, in some cases, you might actually want to slow down and reach your target eventually and land on it, potentially. Uh, and that can be done with placing beams on your uh, leaving point and on your destination. So, all right, let's build some already, right? That we've convinced ourselves maybe this is something we can do to enable fast transport in the solar system. So um, Jim's earlier paper uh, did a nice cost analysis, and so I plugged in some numbers to basically determine what would be the cost of such a system. We came up with something that was really quite expensive, uh, actually similar to maybe what Starshot would be in the end, maybe a factor of 10 larger than that for a microwave array. Uh, to put it in context at the time, I thought, well, that doesn't seem like very much. $100 billion, Apple is worth seven times that much. The Iraq war with all the medical costs cost $6 trillion. So it seems like, hey, that's actually something pretty cool that we can do for something that's actually relative to other human endeavors, not terribly expensive. Uh, so the beam itself is interesting. So this is uh, for a, a circular aperture. You have something that basically is a Fresnel pattern or an uh, airy pattern, many names for this. Uh, and What's interesting is that it gives you an intensity that varies as a function of cylindrical radius in the beam profile. Now you can control this uh, by basically manipulating the beam profile, but it's something that's there if you use a fairly simple circular aperture. Uh, and it's also uh, something that affects the shape of the side lobes. And one thing that I haven't really seen is uh, what this beam profile looks like in the acceleration phase. So, uh, in the near field, the beam remains pretty much concentrated. It has a fixed physical size. So this plot here is just in Cartesian coordinates showing you how the beam propagates outwards. If you notice, though, the beam does have variations in intensity as a function of cylindrical radius as it moves outwards. So those are different intensities that the sail feels at different points as it accelerates. That will lead to differential forces on the sail. And that's something if you're considering a high velocity star shot type thing, you have to be able to address that, either by make, ma ensuring that the beam intensity profile is more smooth, um, or uh, you have to make the sail be capable of sustaining the forces that it will experience on the trip. Uh, so there's, you know, examples of this is like a lighthouse, right? You can see these things. The, the Fresnel length actually of a lighthouse is something like a few tens or hundreds of miles, but the atmosphere will basically uh, smear it out before then. Um, so in this paper, we made a fairly um, simplifying assumption, which was that the sail size and the array were identical in size. Uh, at the time, this seemed like sort of the simplest thing that you can do. You don't really have to point it very much. You just basically beam upwards and let the sail ride along that. Uh, one thing that's really changed, uh, I think it's come to my attention later, is that in principle, if you make the sail smaller than the array, you can put in an additional term in here that will change what the um, optimal frequency to use is for a given sail um, parameters. The other thing you should notice is that we were interested in transporting humans here from Earth to Mars. So we limited this to 1G, right? Because presumably people don't want to be feeling more than 
one G of force for that long of a period of time. Uh, and also we were going for much more pedestrian velocity, 100 kilometers per second, which I thought was pretty great, much better than chemical rockets. That would get you to Mars in 10 days. Basically, what we did is just do a toy model where we did a simulation of launching a sail from Earth. We calculated its trajectory. We looked at how the sail, uh, the beam angle would change as a function of time. And then we simulated catching it with Mars. Um, and one of the things that you're allowed to do here is actually change the sail's orientation relative to the beam such that the force applied is not uh, necessarily along the direction of motion. So this allows you to actually catch the sail with a beamer sitting on the target, which is in this case Mars. And so as Jim mentioned, as the beam uh, tries to track the sail, it will sweep across a large angle. And that's potentially something that can be observable. So when I was flying into Heathrow Airport um, a half a year ago, there's this really obnoxious lighthouse thing that's on top of one of the very tall buildings there. And this thing, I don't know what it's doing, but it's basically waving in all random directions. And I saw it outside of my plane window. Periodically, it would just pass right over the plane window, and you get a very bright flash. Uh, and I was able to capture that with my phone camera. So this actually happened frequently enough that I was able to do this. Um, but this is basically, if you're indiscriminately firing this beam in all directions, you can imagine that occasionally you will see a bright flash from this beam passing over you. In this uh, simple design where we really just had a circular aperture and a simple Fresnel pattern, you have uh, this um, pattern in the far field regime, and this will sweep a cord across that pattern depending on the offset relative to the observer. And if you're looking at this as a radio telescope, you're gonna see something that's gonna have a lot of peaks and valleys as you go over the maxima and minima of that function. And for the parameters that we chose for Earth-Mars transit, it turned out the transient was on the order of seconds with a luminosity of Jansky's at peak um, for something that was at a distance of about 10 parsecs. So pretty detectable uh, if this is what they were employing. So which systems would you actually look at? Well, the ones that are gonna be engaging in this um, that we're gonna be able to detect easily are the ones that appear close to edge on to us, right? Because they're gonna be transmitting craft between the planets in their system in their own ecliptic. So the beams are gonna be preferentially in that plane. And that's one way you can bypass at least one of the two narrow angles um, in the, uh, the beam spread. The other thing that you might wanna do is they're gonna be beaming mostly in the direction of the planet that they're targeting. Uh, that's where they really want the sail to go. Uh, and when they catch the sail, it's the opposite. They're gonna be being mostly opposite the planet that was uh, launching it. So the times they actually look are when they have a conjunction as viewed from Earth. And if you're looking at a list of exoplanetary systems for which you know the orbital parameters of the planets around those systems, and we do actually know them quite well from any nearby transiting systems, you can have a strategy where you basically look when you think the probability of finding these beams is the highest. And so this is how you would divvy up your time between say a list of systems. It's basically when these conjunctions occur. So I thought that uh, when we did this, um, presuming they're all using the same system, uh, you would need to be monitoring about 10 light sail beaming systems continuously to guarantee a detection with breakthrough listen. Obviously, not all 10, there's not necessarily gonna be 10 systems all running something like this. Um, but that was sort of the rough estimate of how many of them you need to be looking at. So, uh, in summary, uh, sails basically offer a way to overcome the tyranny of the rocket equation. The sun is a way that you can do this kind of on the cheap. You don't need to build a beamer, but it is limited in its velocity. And the other thing is that you have to pass near the sun if you really wanted to take advantage of the highest velocities. Uh, so. Uh, I think I'll just leave the rest of my summary points up there and leave time for questions. Questions, please. Okay. One way to get money to develop, one way to get money to develop these things is to have a practical, semi-practical application. And the tyranny of the rocket equation means that if you can get an e-folding or even a, not, a fairly small fraction of an e-folding, you're saving a lot. And how far using solar light pressure are the sales now 
from any applications on which they can start being cost effective and therefore used and really perfected on a larger scale than now? Yeah, I mean, I think it has to do with the surface density of the sails in question. Um, the lower the surface density of the sail, the more thrust that you can get. And so I'm not quite sure like what exactly the, the point is where you actually gain, like if we're at that point yet. I, I don't think we are. The sails are still made of these like thin mylar sheets, which are still relatively dense compared to say the concept we have for star shot. Um, I think it's like three orders of magnitude more dense than, star, um, than Starshot's concept. I think you do have to go down in at least an order of magnitude and density before it starts to become really kind of beneficial. Yes, go ahead. Uh, I, I should mention that uh, in, the, uh, in the experiments my brother and I did at JPL about a decade ago, we used a carbon fiber sail because we were using microwaves. Um, with a, a total power level of only uh, 10 kilowatts. Uh, but we actually managed to, because of uh, desorption, uh, ablation that is, from the, directly from the lattice at a temperature over 2,000 degrees Kelvin, so it was easy to see the sail because it was lit up by itself, um, we achieved uh, a typical exhaust velocities of four to five kilometers a second when we accelerated up to seven Gs until it hit the ceiling of the vacuum chamber at JPL. So it was a successful flight. Uh, I mean, it even landed. Um, yeah, I mean, so that, I would say, that was one of the papers that we really wanted to find was like the experimental results of that, of that particular thing. So, but I would like it to be available to the broader community, if possible. That's, that's the kind of thing I would like, yeah. Well, a further comment then. Uh, actually, the trip, proceedings IEEE had appeared in. The, uh, I can send you, there were about a half a dozen papers, really. Um, we use a, uh, here are critical numbers. We use a kilowatt per square centimeter. The mass d d density was 50 square meters per kilogram. Uh, the accelerations were up to 10 to 12 Gs. And the uh, temperatures reached about 27 Kelvin. The laser experiments, which were done in parallel, first did a pendulum experiment where they just accelerated a pendulum to measure the thrust. When they got up to two-thirds of G, now notice you have to get to one G before you lift off. Right. They got up to two-thirds of G and blew the surface off by ablation, whereas the accelerations Greg's referring to at, at lower accelerations, at lift, lifting off and moving slowly, uh, that was photon acceleration. As we turned up the intensity, uh, then we started to see desorption of material from the lattice that had been embedded in it. That is not, that's not ablation. That's desorption, a well-known phenomena, and so sales will have to be cleaned up. If they don't want that to happen, well, it's free. You know, it happens, and you get a little bit of, you get some substantial thrust out of it. So that, that's a quick summary of those experiments. And the, uh, the, I want you to mention that the laser experiments ablated the material because the skin depth was so short. Right. Yeah. Uh, if anyone watched the movie um, The Martian, uh, the propulsion there to Mars or back was envisioned as being uh, done by ion thrusters, I mean conventional thrusters rather than anything exotic like light sails. But the, the important lesson from that movie is that one has to carry potatoes with you. <laughs> so we will uh, take a break now and uh, then move on to the panel discussion. <laughs>